Welcome to the Justice Committee's 21st meeting of 2017. Apologies have been received from Fulton McGregor and Stuart Stevenson, and I welcome George Adam to the meeting. Following the terrible events in London at the weekend, the presiding officer has notified that there will be a minute silence at 11 a.m. today and as a mark of respect for those who died or have been affected by the attack. So I will suspend at one minute to 11. After the minute silence, we will resume business where we left off and I expect this to be a continuation of our first item of business to which we now come. This is our third evidence session of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill, and I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, paper two, which is a private paper, and paper three, which is a spice paper. And I welcome Anne-Marie Hicks, National Procurator Fiscal for Domestic Abuse and Head of Victims and Witnesses Policy, Policy Team with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Detective Chief Superintendent Leslie Bowell, who, uh, QPM, who is Public Pro uh, Protection Specialist Crime Division and um, Police Scotland, and Callum Steele, who is the General Secretary, Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. Um, I thank the witnesses uh, for providing your written sub submissions. That's always very helpful for the committee. And we'll go straight to questions. I invite questions from members. John Finney. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, panel. So it's a question for, for Mr. Steele. Um, regarding your concerns about what would be anticipated for you in attendance at a, a scene. Could you maybe elaborate that for the, the record, please? Well, well yeah. certainly. I mean, I think the first thing that has to be said from a SPS perspective is that we have absolutely no objections to the sentiments behind the bill. Uh, and I know that that's laid out at, you know, in, in, in some length in, in, in our written submission. Uh, but I, I think probably in, in much as there uh, are differing views from s uh, various sides of the legal profession, whether it's the Crown Office and Pocket or Fiscal Service or those that are uh, representing uh, defence organisa organisations, uh, the police service and police officers are going to find themselves in that particular middle ground. Um, and given that uh, there is a, a, a fundamental difference from physical evidence uh, to um, a, a uh, an interpretation of whether something might amount to a form of psychological um, uh, abuse, that creates new difficulties for police officers. Now, I am not saying that they are not insurmountable. Uh, I dare say that the service has already given some thought as to what the training implications for those might, for dealing with those kind of circumstances might be. It's just that at these very early stages, we don't know what that training might be and how it is that police officers would be expected to deal with the circumstances that are before them. Um, Often there's reference made to the joint protocol between Police Scotland and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and I had a look at that and particularly, and I, I acknowledge this is in relation to the issue of counter allegations, um, there's a whole list of factors that could be taken on board and one of them is careful consideration to be given all the relevant factors including and <clears throat> officers' professional judgment. Is, is it not the case that you're not being asked to do anything different from the moment and there will be dealing with the immediate situation and there will be subsequent inquiries that may have to be taken. That may be the case, uh, but we, we, have, we have before us a, 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 you know, a series of draft proposals which uh, move away from, uh, like I said, this, the issue of uh, physical evidence uh, to uh, particular degrees of interpretation as to what uh, some kind of intent might be. Now, intent when there is a physical act behind it, where if, if I was, for example, to swing a punch and miss the intent, uh, because of the physical uh, act before it is easier to uh, is easier to draw, uh, or certainly easier to draw a, an inference from. But intent in terms of some of the other activities, such as the alleged withdrawing of uh, withholding of money, as a as a particular example, or uh, the constant belittling uh, of uh, of a, um, um, of A or B, um, to use the terminology that's laid in the legislation, where there is no direct evidence of that other than the allegation of the, the complaint is, 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 is a difficulty for, or a potential difficulty for police officers. I, I, under, I understand that, and it's perhaps unlikely that if it's a course of behaviour, that's not necessarily going to be established instantly on attendance at the scene. 
to understand, uh, Mr Steele, how, how it differs from the situation as I understand it at the moment where police officers might attend a scene, there would be a liaison with the Crown Office Procurator of Fiscal Service, an inquiry done into previous background and, and the, uh, of the alleged perpetrator, and this has brought about some of these historic cases where a perpetrator has moved from household to household creating mayhem. It's not something that's immediately apparent on arrival at the locus, but it's something that's established by inquiry, by diligent inquiry by police officers. I, again, I, I accept that that might be the case. Uh, at, at the risk of going back to some of the comments that we made in, in the previous session that was uh, looking at the uh, role of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, uh, the operational experience of police officers, and indeed this, in some instances, and indeed this was uh, appeared to have been supported by uh, other witnesses, particularly those that were working in the legal profession, and indeed uh, apparently some uh, uh, anonymous procurator fiscals that came forward to provide evidence indicated that the professional judgment of those that were working in those spheres was not av as available to them as the joint protocol might have suggested. Right, so it, it, it's fundamentally a resource issue because you previously mentioned training. <laughs> as, as you well know, uh, Mr Funny, when it comes to policing, it's always a resource issue. Uh, and uh, in, in many ways, the, the events, and just to, to digress slightly, the events of the past number of weeks uh, serve to reinforce that. Uh, but we have a, one, once we have an understanding of what the training to be delivered to police officers and how, they are, uh, how that is expected to be uh, worked through in terms of practical application in the event that this bill eventually gets passed, uh, then we'll have a better understanding as to whether the capabilities of the police service to deliver this training properly to enable police officers to respond effectively to the needs of victims uh, will be in place. I mean, I would be concerned if there was any suggestion, and, and I know that this isn't the background to you coming forward with these, but an interpretation could be made that, you know, there's, we can't rely on officers' judgment on this. this. This is another string to the bow to deal with what's a very pernicious uh, course of conduct, domestic abuse. And... I'm sure your members will rise to the occasion. Were it to pass? Uh, as, as, uh, as I'm sure you'll attest, your, your own experience shows that when it comes to dealing with difficult situations, police officers, provided they have the capability and the training to do uh, what is being asked of them, are more than capable of delivering that. Um, the you know, police officers have uh, lots of uh, life skills upon which to draw. Uh, occasionally, uh, their ability to draw on those skills are somewhat curtailed uh, because of an expectation that if A happens, then B, C and D must follow. Uh, that, that does not provide, and I'm not saying it should in all cases, but that does not provide an unfettered discretion uh, for police officers to uh, deal with the events that they find before them. Of course, there will always be requirements for undertaking subsequent or additional uh, inquiries. Very, very rarely do you come across an incident where everything is packaged before you to such an extent that you don't have to go back and uh, don't have to undertake uh, further examination. And particularly in the cases of domestic abuse, where there is a likelihood uh, that it is, sorry, where it is, uh, rather than a likelihood, where it is unlikely that the first occasion that the police are being called is the first occasion that something has happened, of course, because of the way in which the police service has developed over many, many years, uh, and particularly the work of uh, the Domestic Violence Task Force uh, in undertaking uh, retrospective examinations and seeking of witnesses, of course there's the capability to gather that additional evidence. Uh, but we need to see what the training is going to look like. Um, we need to make sure that the service is going to properly invest in this, because we do not want to find ourselves where police officers find themselves ill-equipped uh, and uh, unprepared to deal with uh, this new additional uh, piece of legislation which could ultimately then find them in a really difficult situation uh, when they come to court. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could just um, ask a little bit more about how this, uh, this legislation may impinge on the role of the, the police officers. In particular, in your submission, you say police officers, there's an expectation, in fact, that um, there are cases where police officers could be dragged in as a reasonable person? Uh, yeah, thank you, convener. Um, the, the reasonable person test is not one that is unknown to police officers. In fact, it's one that's very common in a whole variety of, of, of different pieces of legislation. Uh, and that's both UK legislation and also uh, legislation that the Scottish Parliament has passed. You know, the reasonable, the reasonable person or reasonable driver test, for example, is one that applies to careless driving. Um, so, th so that uh, notion of uh, reasonableness uh, is, is not something that is new. However, 
and this is the, the important point, the reasonable uh, assessment in many instances is drawn from an event or a series of activities that are actually physically witnessed or have a form of uh, evidence that, or form of vis visual evidence that supports them. Uh, that is much more difficult to obtain, I submit, uh, in cases where there are forms of psychological abuse. Okay. Um, Mary? Thank you, convener. I would really just like to focus on a couple of points and issues that were raised during the evidence session that we took last week, where we heard from the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland as well, and they highlighted what they saw as potential problems in prosecuting the crimes with the proposed legislation. Um, one of the examples that they raised are, would be a case where, uh, such as where the victim themselves isn't a witness because they don't believe that they're uh, that they're a victim of a crime and therefore they're not able to give evidence. Now, would you see any difficulties in prosecuting a, a case uh, in that kind of scenario where it is, say, dependent more on third-party evidence rather than from the pe person experiencing that themselves? In most cases involving harm, whether it be a domestic abuse case or, or any other case, whether it be a, an assault on a member of the public, the complainer, the, the victim, will be the primary evidence, and, and that is the, is the case across the board, and it's certainly the case in domestic abuse. But that doesn't mean to say there won't be cases where you could have a case where the complainer wasn't a witness. Um, if they weren't, you would have to get sources of evidence from somewhere else. So that would be uh, looking further afield to see where the other evidence could come from. It's, uh, has someone else witnessed something? That could be a friend or family member. It could be a child of their family. If it's something that's happened in public, it could be another member of the public or a neighbour. Um, you have to look for other sources of evidence. So it's unusual, um, but it happens. And we would just have to apply the same test that we would currently in terms of corroborating our, our evidence the case. I mean, following on from that, I think another concern that was expressed was about the, adm the admission of hearsay evidence and the, what they proposed was the danger of asking non-expert witnesses to express opinion in court where they're currently not allowed to do that at the moment. And I suppose I'm thinking particularly of the coercive and controlling behaviour aspect of that. So if you can see that behaviour and it's happening to somebody else, you can see the impact of, of that or the, the victim themselves, their behaviour changing, um, and you're then trying to express that in court, I, again, without, say, the victim themselves giving the evidence to that. Um, it was just really to get your, your thoughts on that kind of scenario too, and if you see any, any difficulties with that. I think this is obviously um, introducing quite novel um, concepts in terms of looking at relevant effects. And as Mr Steele said, we are more used to seeing, um, looking at harm caused perhaps an assault or you know, threatening abusive behaviour where there's perhaps something more concrete there. So this is novel, it is quite groundbreaking. But we will still have to gather evidence um, around um, these other behaviours. And it isn't the case that we would be looking for other witnesses to give some kind of expert or opinion evidence on someone's psychological um, state. What they would be giving evidence of would be behaviours that would um, lead that person to, to have the distress. So you might have someone speaking to what they had witnessed um, perhaps the, the perpetrator doing. They might also be speaking to um, how the, the victim was reacting in a particular situation um, or um, something else that they had witnessed. So they're not giving expert opinion evidence. They are simply speaking to what they have seen um, or heard or observed in some other way themselves. So I don't think the position's any different from, from currently in terms of hearsay provisions. Okay, thank you. Um, another concern that we heard last week was the broad definition of abusive behaviour, and I suppose a fear that this might, the proposed legislation might criminalise behaviour um, or capture behaviour that it wasn't intended uh, to capture. Um, do you think that that's something that needs to be more tightly defined, or would you agree with the, the definition as it sits at the moment? I'm supportive of the definition. I think when dealing with domestic abuse, it's always been an area where people have said you're straying into family life, you know, is this not a danger? Even currently under the present law, that's sometimes said, are we not criminalising normal behaviours in a relationship? 
we're not currently, and under this legislation as drafted, I don't think it does. What it does is define abusive behaviour as either violent, threatening or intimidating, or in terms of relevant effects, which include controlling, punishing, humiliating, degrading, frightening someone. Well, I have to say that's not how I would define normal friction in a relationship. And I think once you get to the boundaries of talking about degrading, humiliating, punishing treatment, then I think that's where the criminal law should be stepping in. That's not normal friction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps someone will bring this up later, so we'll move on. Ben. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Touching on some, some of the points uh, raised in, in answer to Mary Evans, uh, Amory Hicks, just wanted to pick up on some of the, the points from your, your written submissions. Uh, you speak, uh, in, in the written submissions, it states that the, uh, the proposed offence addresses a gap in existing law by recognising that domestic abuse may not only damage or violate a victim's physical integrity, but may also undermine a victim's character, restricting a victim's autonomy and freedom and their ability to live their life in the manner they choose. Can you maybe just expand on why you think a, a, a new specific offence is, is so important to cover that, that, that uh, different absolutely. area of, of behaviour? So at the moment we are limited to um, offences that, that would essentially attack the physical integrity of someone. So it might be an assault, it might be threatening and abusive behaviour, um, offences which should properly be criminalised, but we have a gap at the moment in terms of a lot of the coercive and controlling behaviour, which might be very degrading, it might be humiliating, it might involve a tremendous abuse of power and control where someone is controlled in their everyday life, no longer have freedom of action to go out to do what they would normally do and to make the normal choices that you and I would take for granted. I think when those behaviours um, become perhaps threatening uh, or abusive, we can use current legislation, but in many cases we can't. And so there is a gap that we know these behaviours take place. We hear directly from, from victims all the time about the behaviours that go on, which amount to uh, abuse of power and control, but we can't actually take action in respect of these. So there is a gap in, in respect of addressing that. And the problem with that is that the law is then only dealing with it in a very episodic manner. We're looking at discrete incidents and isolated incidents of perhaps assault or threats, but we're not actually seeing the bigger picture and the ongoing pattern of cumulative abuse that people are subjected to, and that can't be right. Thank you. And, and in terms of uh, addressing that gap, one of the, the key parts of this legislation will be the, the definitions within it and, and, and how that can be, be utilised by prosecutors and, and courts going forward. One of the concerns that was raised by uh, other parties giving evidence was around the inclusion of uh, recklessness at uh, section 12B2. Uh, and I just wondered if you could comment on, on your view as, as a prosecutor about the inclusion of recklessness um, and also its uh, re relationship with the, the aspect of mens rea in criminal law. Recklessness is, is not a new concept. We have this in a number of, of other areas. We have had a, a crime of culpable and reckless behaviour for years. We also have a test of recklessness in the Section 38, threatening and abusive behaviour um, offence, and also the thir Section 39, stalking offence, um, which terms it as where someone knew or ought to have known. I think it's a concept that prosecutors are familiar with um, and it can be very useful in cases, particularly where it isn't always um, easy to establish intent. Now, intent in terms of the mens rea that we have to prove is usually um, something that we can infer from the actions of an accused. But I think particularly where you're dealing with perhaps more nuanced behaviour, intent is very easy to establish. Usually if there's an assault or there are threats issued, but when you're dealing with a lot more nuanced behaviour, I think the concept of recklessness is, is a valid one. But I think it's important to note that this is not recklessness in the way that you and I might regard that in our ordinary lives as a kind of carelessness. This is a criminal recklessness. It's, it's a criminal disregard where you almost disregard whatever the consequences might be. So, there, you know, there are, the courts are used to applying these tests as are prosecutors. And I think when we're dealing with a lot of the kind of different types of nuanced behaviour that we are in terms of this, um, it will be useful to have that, as we've seen with the stalking offence, which again brings in other types of behaviour that perhaps weren't traditionally criminal. And I think recklessness has been a really important uh, concept there. For clarity, you're, you're supportive of the inclusion of recklessness. Absolutely, in, in the, absolutely. Yeah. I, think, one, I think it would be difficult not to have it. And just one last point, convener, thank you. Um, also, in, in the written uh, evidence that you provided, you, you speak about how the, uh, 
domestic abuse remains chronically underreported in Scotland, and there are a number of complex reasons for this. Uh, and in, it is anticipated that the introduction of a bespoke offence will raise awareness and confidence in Scotland's criminal justice system to effectively respond to the victims of domestic abuse. How, how important do you do you emphasise that that wider point of social change, um, and that it is expected that? This, this bill, if passed, could have a positive impact on the reporting of domestic abuse and encourage some victims to come forward where previously they would have would not have. I think it's incredibly important. I think when you have sound laws and effective enforcement, then people do have confidence. Um, they have confidence in law enforcement. They have confidence to come forward. I think there's also something about calling people's experience what it is. And we've seen that with the stalking offence. When stalking first came in, the first year that it came in, there were 67 people prosecuted. Five years later, there was nearly 800. So there is something about people recognising behaviour um, and, and giving it a name for what it is. And there's a lot of victims of domestic abuse who will say, I'm not a victim of domestic abuse because he doesn't hit me. And that, that's a common thing. And Women's Aid will tell you that is a really common thing they will say. So it's about people um, shining a light to what the experience is and saying to people, the law of the land actually recognises what you're being subjected to, that this behaviour is wrong, um, it's unacceptable, and, and that you can come forward. So I think we've had a number of experiences where um, new legislation can be a really positive driver in terms of encouraging people to, to report the harm that's done to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if Leslie Bowl, if you have anything to add? Or? Um, I, I suppose I was hoping to add um, or, or respond to uh, Callum's um, submission earlier on about police officers and um, how this is somewhat new. It is a new piece of legislation. It is not a new concept. Um, we have reports of coercive control um, just now, many years uh, previously. I can say it since the uh, inception of Police Scotland, there has been 1,893 high tariff offenders um, investigated alone by the National um, Domestic Abuse Task Force. And I'm told that nearly all of those cases involved coercive control. And, and I suppose the bit about um, officers maybe finding it difficult to identify what could be psychological harm I think officers do a really good job at doing this already and have done for many years. Um, whilst we're talking about domestic abuse just now, if we look at child protection, the threshold for child protection is at risk of significant harm or maybe at risk of significant harm. So officers are able to um, discuss, make judgments around harm around child protection already. If we even look back to the 1937 Act, Children and Young Persons Act, which we have all dealt with, you know, from, from police officers and prosecutors, the definition of that includes the likelihood, the likelihood of some sort of psychological harm. And officers, whilst it might not be child protection, but we, we look for wellbeing concerns on a daily basis. So even within Scotland for the last 10 years, looking at GERFEC, getting it right for every child, looking at the holistic assessments of, an in, of, of, a, of a child and how um, there may be harm involved there. I think this is something that police officers do on a day-to-day -day basis and are actually really well equipped to do that. And of course, Police Scotland has introduced a domestic abuse questionnaire. They introduced it um, last, sorry, last year. And that includes on every domestic abuse incident, the victim will be asked a series of questions. There's 26 and there's some subcategories to that um, to try and establish more of the circumstances around that individual's life, more holistic circumstances. So they're asked things like, um, you know, has the, has the perpetrator ever hurt a pet or an animal? The last, if they've ever used weapons or objects, um, if they have ever, um, if there's any been any financial harm um, to them, whether they're dependent on money or otherwise, whether there's mental health problems, has there been suicide attempts, all the risk factors that actually would provide the officer with that um, greater knowledge to be able to make some assessment in terms of harm. And as Mr Finney suggested, 
we might not, the, the first responding officer might not get it right on every single occasion, but that's why we've built in a series of checks and balances. So for every domestic abuse case or every domestic abuse incident is reported, as well as doing the questionnaire form, there is a domestic abuse concern form raised. And if there's a child in the household, there's a child concern form raised as well to comply with GERFIC. What would happen then is that is checked by their supervisory officer. So I suppose we're talking about belt base embraces. And then that's then submitted before the officer um, uh, finishes for duty that day to the divisional, and this happens in each of the 13 divisions, the divisional concern hub, who look at all the domestic abuse and child and adult concern forms that are submitted. And they look at it holistically. So they'll look at other concern forms that we might have to try and pick up a pattern or an escalation um, in terms of information. So that's really the sort of belt braces and stay up trousers, I suppose, in terms that you're going through three different assessments as to what, what does this actually look like? What, is that, what, what, what are the um, implications for that victim? And what can happen after that is that there could be a referral to the domestic abuse liaison officer. There's obviously going to be, um, with the consent, referrals to support and advocacy services. But there could be a referral to the domestic abuse liaison officer who may visit, along with support services. Or what might happen is the case might be referred through what is the multi-agency tasking and coordinating meeting, which is looking at perpetrators, as Mr Finney says, that bit about looking at what's happening now and looking backwards and gathering evidence from a range of individuals to see exactly the coercive behaviour involved. So I know this might be a new bit of legislation because the difficulty is that when we investigate at the moment, as anne Marie's very clearly said, we might have to charge for single incidents, single offences, in terms of that holistic perspective on, that abu on the, their abusive behaviour. So, so for me, I don't think it's anything new. I think police officers are well equipped and absolutely I agree with Callum, we have to do more and we will do more and we have got plans in place to do more. But in actual fact is this, I think that there's some um, commentary being made about too many hurdles. I think that together with really good guidance and, and, and um, explanatory notes, this piece of legislation that we can overcome those hurdles. That's been helpful to put some um, context into the coercive behaviour and, and to look at these various pointers that, that can be looked at. Rona. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, yeah, just to expand a wee bit, I was going to ask you on the impact of domestic abuse on children. Um, and in the bill, um, is a statutory ag aggravator, um, which um, we've received some written submissions, quite a few written submissions from various organisations saying that possibly the, the scope of that isn't wide enough uh, in relation to children. Um, I know that the COPs are very supportive of the bill generally and, and also of the, the aggravator. But in a case of where, say, a child's used as a pawn or, you know, maybe um, subjected to hearing the abuse from a separate room, should it be more specific in that case to protect the child? What are your views on that? I think the aggravation is a really positive step in actually increasing the visibility of, of children in the process. It's, it's an area that we have considered along with the police quite carefully in terms of the launch of our joint protocol um, just less than two months ago. And we consulted as part of that process with the, the children's stakeholders. And it was one of the, the kind of recurring feedback um, that, that has come to us both directly from children and, and from those who represent them around the need for children to be <coughs> excuse me, visible and more visible within the process. And so we introduced some provisions there around making sure that children are spoken to at the time of instance to find out what happened from them and make sure that other provisions in terms of special measures, obtaining their views, joint investigative interviewing and, and, and other provisions are in place. Um, so I think it's a really positive move that we have an aggravation. I think um, having something that allows a sentencer to um, potentially enhance a sentence, because um, at the moment, if, if an incident, for, an, for instance, an assault were to occur in front of a child, um, I would expect a, a lot of occasions a sheriff to perhaps comment on that, perhaps take that into account. But there's no formal mechanism for doing that and there's no formal mechanism for, for increasing sentence. And I think it's really important that we do. Um, I think um, the 
terms of where the aggravation applies as well um, are quite wide ranging and I think would capture most um, of the situations both in terms of directing behaviour at a child which could be any manner of behaviour in terms of the abuse also making use of children because we hear that quite a lot where they are used to actually perpetrate abuse on the victim um, but also having the child where the eyes see, either see or hear or, or otherwise present during the incident and I think having these um, factors could truly aggravate a sentence and could lead a censor to say that the accused has acted in some way in the knowledge that children are affected and, and, and there's a, a de degree of deliberateness then in their, in their conduct. Um, we've had quite a lot of discussions with the children's stakeholders over the development of this bill and I fully accept that they would like it to go further and have an offence of, of domestic abuse involving a child. I think they have very compelling um, points to make in terms of the harm and I think in no way would I say that everything here captures all the harm that's ever done to children in a domestic abuse situation. The harm can be wide ranging and long lasting and infect them in so many ways. But this is in terms of trying to reflect upon an accused conduct and what you could then truly enhance a sentence for. I also think when you have domestic abuses being partners or ex-partners, I think it's problematic to then have an offence of domestic abuse involving a child. And I think there are difficulties around that. Um, but I'm kind of reassured, I have to say, by the, the moves that are made more widely about, um, Leslie referred to the, um, the 1937 Act, the Section 12 offence, and I know there have been concerns um, expressed in a number of quarters around that. So I'm really pleased that there is going to be consultation on that um, and, and wider in terms of how we actually fully capture other harms which are done to children. Um, and I think there could be further developments down the line. But in terms of what we have now, I think that's a really a very positive step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie, do you have anything to... No, I, I suppose, um, having been the lead for child protection for Police Scotland for the last three years, you know, I am absolutely acutely aware of the devastating impact that domestic abuse can have on children. Um, and, and if I'm being honest, when I first um, took over for, from domestic abuse just a few weeks ago, um, I, my initial approach or my initial thoughts were there, there should be a separate offence for when a perpetrator uses a child as a proxy. So I quite agree in terms of the aggravator in terms of when a child is within the household, but when his actual intention is to use the child to further the coercive um, control of his partner or ex-partner, I initially thought, should, could that be another section? Um, saying that, um, I absolutely understand that the reason and the rationale for the bill um, is, is, is really to, you know, sort of, it's designed to capture the nature and dynamics of that relationship or ex-relationship. And I am fully aware, because I have been lobbying it for some times for a change for Section 12, and absolutely aware that the Scottish Government is looking at it in depth. So um, I'm sort of... I'm sort of a, Sometime in the future, it should be a separate offence. Absolutely, right. absolutely. It, mm -hmm. it definitely should be a separate offence. Um, now, whether it's in this bill or whether it's in the the new legislation that's been designed specifically for children. Um, I probably think on balance it's probably best to wait until that other bill is developed a bit more because I know it's going to be quite complex, quite tricky in terms of wording. Um, but I am absolutely um, happy that the aggravation is in place, it should be in place, and we strongly support that. John, do you have a view on it? Uh, similar to similar to that of of, of Leslie, the, the the in fact in many ways the need for the aggravation for when children are uh, u utilised us, whether pawns or otherwise in, in uh, abusive relationships, it's more than uh, it's more than right and uh, proper that that particular kind of aggravating behaviour is recognised and made known to the uh, made known to the courts, uh, because of course that you know whilst um, uh, adults. Um, can be more robust, regardless of the circumstances in which they find themselves. Uh, the effects on children at the you know, very outset of their lives can be uh, much longer lived than, uh, than anyone else. Okay, thank you. Mary, followed by Douglas, Oliver, and then Liam. 
Thank you, um, convener. Um, can I just ask you your views um, on the inclusion of other types of family abuse? Because we've had some um, suggestion that um, where an, an adult child abuses a parent, that, that should be included. Um, do, do you share that view or do you think other legislation um, can pick up that type of abuse? I don't share that view. I know in England and Wales they have uh, widened their definition of domestic abuse to include familial abuse, whether that's between siblings or abuse of the elderly or abuse by parents of children. Uh, and perhaps they, they had their good reasons for that. I, I wasn't privy to the, to the discussion, but I am um, convinced that um, I think we should maintain our definition and the scope of this bill. I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I think we have a national definition of domestic abuse, which um, has, is widely shared and, and worked towards by a number of the agencies. Um, and it's based on the, the gendered approach and the acknowledgement of the inequalities um, and violence against women. And I think when we have a situation where still 80% of our domestic incidents involve um, abuse of women by men, then I would be very reluctant for us to move away from that definition, which, which refers to partners and ex-partners. The Crown Office and Fiscal Service definition, which we share with the police in the joint protocol and has been in place since 2004, and, and I think before that, is again partners and ex-partners. And we also see that mirrored in legislation, both criminal and civil, Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2011, the Abusive Behaviour Bill from uh, Act from last year. So I think um, it would be um, difficult, I think, to move away from it. I don't think it would be the right thing to do in terms of the steps that have been taken over a number of years to increase public awareness of domestic abuse and what it is. Um, and I think it has to be acknowledged there are very unique dynamics in domestic abuse and there's a large research and evidence base supporting that. I think that's not to say that there aren't other types of abuse towards individuals which can have some of the similar characteristics and can also be heinous. And it's not to say that these things are any less serious. But I think there's a danger in calling everything domestic abuse and then you dilute it and you actually lose the focus of what you're doing and suddenly it, it becomes less important and, and people don't understand actually what it is um, that we're dealing with. So it's not a case that we would say that if there was harm in another situation that you wouldn't address that. But I think the focus on domestic abuse should firmly remain on partners and ex-partners. That's been very helpful. Leslie? I can't add anything more that Anne Marie has already said. Um, we absolutely support um, the position that is at the moment that it is domestic abuse between partners and ex-partners. Um, do you have a view? Yeah, similarly, concur, uh, uh, similar, similarly concur, and I don't think that in any way diminishes the fact that uh, where uh, adult children abuse uh, or uh, in, in whatever shape, way, shape or form their parents, that that in itself is a serious issue. Uh, but I think there's got to be a complete distinction between that and domestic abuse as we currently know it. Okay. Um, Callum, can I, can I just um, ask you about something that's in um, your, your written submission? Because to, to an extent, it, it gave me food for um, thought. When you talk about the, um, the apparent policy approach to domestic abuse is one geared exclusively towards punishment. And if you think of not all other crime, but certainly a, a great extent of other crime, we talk about rehabilitation, reforming, changing behaviours, the government have talked a lot about early interventions and, and working with uh, offenders. Do you think there is um, more of a need, specifically in relation to domestic abuse, as this bill progresses, that we think about how we deal with people that are committed of the crime of domestic abuse and how we change their behaviour? Because what I, I don't think any of us will want will be repeat offenders in, in domestic abuse and perhaps an escalation in their behaviour. Yourself, convener. The reason that we made that observation comment was not to detract from the issues that the bill is trying to address. And indeed, I can't think of any legislation that, in some way, shape, or form, doesn't have punishment in, in, at, its, at its core, uh, whether that's uh, imprisonment, whether it's fining, or, or, or whatever. It was more a general observation that, as, as a nation, we seem to be dealing with this issue almost exclusively through the punishment arena rather than what we do with other uh, activities, even driver behaviour, uh, we try and introduce some form of uh, rehabilitation or some form of, uh, some form of uh, awareness as to the behaviours that, uh, that are wrong. I think that's a hugely distinct and separate issue from the actual legislation that is before us. 
Um, but I, I do think, you know, as a society, no matter what the behaviour is, no matter how bad the behaviour is, we can't, to my mind, get to a situation where we think that the only way of dealing with it is always going to be through punishment. I, I, I you know, it's, it's fundamentally uh, uh, at odds with the message that we give in a whole variety of uh, other different uh, areas. Leslie or Anne, do you have a, a I, I don't agree that our approach is mm. about punishment. Um, certainly from the Crown's perspective, I think the, the driving force is about protection of the public and prevention of future harm. I think this links in directly to the national strategy, which actually recognises and equally safe the importance of having you know, appropriate laws and robust and effective um, a, a enforcement and prosecution. So I think these things are about preventing future harm to, to the public. Um, I think um, that this, this will be another tool in the armoury in order to do that, and it isn't really about punishing offenders, albeit that, as, as Callum said, there is a punishment part. That's not the driver for it. Yeah, I suppose <clears throat> just 2016-17, uh, there were just under 58,500 domestic abuse incidents uh, recorded by Police Scotland, and of those, 49% um, resulted in one or more crimes being um, recorded. And we know from the uh, Crime and Justice Survey that just less than 20% of domestic abuse cases are reported to the police. And we know from um, research from support agencies the, the time it takes for somebody to disclose the f first um, to, to a person about the domestic abuse. And I think it's probably correct in terms of what Callum saying around the legislation and enforcement, um, what we need in Scotland is a long-term national prevention campaign around domestic abuse, which actually highlights to potential victims, potential perpetrators, to bystanders, challenging social norms, and of course, the legislation and enforcement. And I think that's exactly what Equally Safe are working towards and, and trying to achieve in that term that, that, that national prevention um, campaign around domestic abuse. So I think there's an awful lot of work ongoing in Scotland um, and enforcement and legislation is one part, one important part, but one part of that whole prevention campaign. I think in, in the past there have been a number of different um, almost public broadcasts and awareness raising campaigns around the issue of domestic violence. Um, do you think then, as this, as this legislation progresses, that should be a longer term strategy? Do. Um, and, and I think it's a bit about having now whether it's a 10 year strategy or around exactly how, how we can ensure that uh, all the different component parts, how bystanders, bystanders I think are really important is, is in addition to the sort of social norms, how that information is, is uh, provided consistently, um, not just sporadically, but I'm, the way I sort of see it is like a golden thread and people will learn through osmosis. So from every, you know, the strategy has to be uh, well thought out that it covers all the different component parts of domestic abuse. If we're aiming for societal change, societal change takes a long time. So we need a long-term strategy. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Douglas Ross, followed by Oliver Mundell, then Liam and John. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Uh, Mr Steele, you said back in November, to, to follow up on John Finney's point, that couples could no longer have a row without one of them leaving in handcuffs if police are called. Do you stand by that statement, and do you think that approach would continue under the proposed legislation we're discussing today? Uh, yes, thank you. And again, through yourself, Camina, and I think for complete accuracy, has it almost got into the stage where that's the case. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of where we are, um, I don't think it's as uh, extreme as, the, as as was once the case. Uh, I, th I think it's uh, also in, uh, more than uh, uh, right to identify that those concerns were not just raised by me. Uh, on behalf of police officers, they were raised by uh, defence agents uh, and uh, and others. Uh, I, I don't think that that um, uh, exists to the same extent. Um, uh, in, in truth, the approaches to uh, the awareness of domestic violence has somewhat come with a ripple through Scotland. I mean, uh, the former Chief Constable Sir Stephen House was very, very strong in the focus and emphasis that he put on it uh, in the former Strathclyde Police uh, and even uh, the... 
rigour uh, with which uh, it was applied within Police Scotland uh, didn't took a while to catch up to uh, a fairly universal standard. Uh, and I think that whilst uh, uh, some officers in some areas were working towards getting towards the uh, what had been by then a long stand a long standing a long developed understanding as to how the process for dealing with domestic abuse uh, had matured over the time, uh, Officer Stephen House, and in particular in Strathclyde Police, that they had eventually caught up with that uh, across the rest of Scotland. Uh, I still think it is a danger that uh, on occasions uh, there is, a, there, there is a, a potential that uh, what I think what some have described as uh, ordinary domestic friction can result in some unnecessary intervention by the, uh, by the police. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, you know, it's always going to be a difficult situation. Uh, I know and have uh, direct experience, uh, sorry, I have second-hand, third-hand experience from, even from my members uh, who uh, articulate to me a series of circumstances and events which, uh, when you have an understanding of the, the background to, to what was there, the fact that someone was arrested and left, uh, left uh, the family home in, in, in handcuffs is, is difficult to understand. Um, uh, for example, I'm aware of a situation where an uh, a partner was having um, some kind of uh, mental difficulties. Uh, the other partner phoned the police because they were aware uh, that that was likely to result in some kind of disorder in the house that evening. Uh, sure enough, that happened and the police came along and the partner with the mental difficulties ended up leaving in the proverbial handcuffs. The, subsequently, that partner appeared from custody, uh, was given bail conditions that they could not return home. Uh, which meant that uh, they had to find temporary accommodation. The temporary accommodation would not accommodate a pet. The pet was the only source of comfort that was available to the individual uh, with uh, these difficulties. So whilst there will always be those kind, uh, and indeed the, the case ultimately, uh, as I understand it, did, uh, did not proceed. So whilst there will always be these individual examples that are horrific, um, I, I don't think that in any way suggests that the Scottish Police Federation, and I don't think it should suggest that the Scottish Police Federation is anything other than supporter of a very strong and robust approach to uh, domestic violence. What of course is important in all of this is that on the occasions where, with the best of intentions, we get it wrong, or are seen to be getting it wrong, is that the service supports the officers for making those decisions with the best of intentions. And that we're able to say sorry if we have to. And, and can I ask Leslie Bowe from Police Scotland, do you recognise uh, what Callum Steele is describing there? Do Police Scotland accept that on occasions um, you know, these scenarios that he has outlined uh, are happening in Scotland and, and would potentially continue to happen with this legislation? I wouldn't want to comment on the specific incident that Callum has mentioned because I have got no knowledge of it. Is there an understanding from Police Scotland? I mean, we have the Federation saying this is what their officers are saying. Would you accept that on behalf of Police Scotland, that that is happening? Um, Police Scotland has never provided anything other than guidance to officers around investigating to obtain a sufficiency of evidence. And when there is a sufficiency of evidence, then the individual would be uh, maybe arrested and reported to the procurator fiscal. Um, I appreciate that there might have been misunderstandings at the beginning of Police Scotland. The Domestic Abuse Task Force and the Domestic Abuse Coordination Unit have been doing significant work to provide guidance and understanding. And in each division, there's, or within Police Scotland, there's a domestic abuse forum where local policing officers uh, and from divisions meet uh, to discuss difficulties, misunderstandings, how policy and practice and standard operating procedures can be amended and adapted because of particular circumstances or difficulties. That has been ongoing. There is, I would have to say, in the area of policing, there is probably more guidance, more opportunity for liaison support, interaction around domestic abuse than there is probably in any other area of policing. Um, now, officers will, will make those decisions when they are faced with a situation, whether to arrest or not, they should only be making those decisions if there is a sufficiency of evidence to do so. C could I um, move on to Anne-Marie Hicks? And, and I had a similar quote highlighted 
to the one that Ben McPherson asked you, and it's about, um, as you say in your evidence, it is anticipated that the introduction of a bespoke offence will raise awareness and confidence in Scotland's criminal justice system to effectively respond to the victims of domestic abuse. And in your answer, you said we need to have sound laws and effective enforcement. Does that indicate that at the moment you don't believe we have sound laws and effective enforcement? And that then leads me on to the quote that we had from Leslie Bowe, who says, I don't think uh, this is anything new. So, so I'm just struggling to understand how we have the Crown Office saying, you know, this new legislation will encourage people to report domestic violence uh, and coercive behaviour, etc. Yet Police Scotland saying this is absolutely nothing new. So the first thing I would say is um, I wouldn't read into what I said to Mr McPherson to, to, say, to put the slant on it that you have. Um, I'm not saying under any circumstances that we don't have sound laws at the moment. The laws that we have in place and the enforcement we have in place um, is robust and it's effective. What we're talking about is legislating for something new, something additional. So it's not saying that we don't have sound laws, but what we're saying is that we recognise that there are other harms that are perhaps not captured. So there's a need to, to, is, to legislate. The Police Scotland are saying this is not new. That, that we do. I mean, we have legislation at the moment. Okay, you could charge someone in, in bits, but the legislation is there to charge someone with this behaviour. Therefore, you're saying this will encourage people because of this new legislation. Police Scotland say it's not new. We've already got it. No, I think what Leslie was saying is this is not new in the sense that we um, have never dealt with the concept of coercive control, that we've never heard about controlling behaviour, that somehow this would be a complete new departure. It's not ground zero. We have all seen this behaviour coming to us in the statements that we get. In many of the cases, we will, we will hear about controlling behaviour. I used to run the domestic abuse unit in Glasgow. I set it up and ran it for a number of years. Um, and before we even knew around the, uh, the research and, and um, the typologies where we would talk about coercive control or intimate terrorism, we would actively talk about it's a power and control domestic or it's um, a bad time in a relationship domestic. So we were already seeing these cases coming through. We do understand that, and as Leslie had set out, the police are now doing a risk assessment where that evidence of control is coming in. So to the extent it won't be a situation where people say, oh my goodness, this is a completely new concept I've never heard about. It will be a new law that will help us to enforce that and to take action, but it's not a new concept. It's, it's something that we see day and daily in terms of the, the distress that victims are in. Um, Leslie Bull set out in, in quite a lot of detail the context, you know, the was there any abuse to the animal, all these things that were perhaps pointers that might indicate it, but it wasn't covered um, in the law as coercive behaviour. Absolutely, sorry, and if I've, if, I, if you've misinterpreted um, what I was trying to explain, I think my, my, <clears throat> my point was in terms of this is new, not a new concept, it's not new behaviour that we've never tried to identify before. It's not new for police officers to be able, or to try and um, to make some assessment on the harm that could be caused. It's a new piece of legislation and I absolutely agree with Anne-Marie in terms of is there a gap at the moment in legislation? Yes, there is. Uh, there, because quite a lot of the behaviour and quite horrific behaviour has to be maybe suggested as a breach of the peace, if based. You know, so so my, my point was really in relation to Callum's position that this is, new, this is going to be new for police officers. My position is that we have been, we understand coercive control and police officers, I think, have been, um, been able to capture that type of evidence during their investigations for a period of time. And finally, could I ask, it, because the, the quote from the Crown Office submission finishes, it is expected that this, the new legislation, will have a positive impact on reporting of domestic abuse and encourage some victims to come forward where they previously would not have. It, now, you know, everyone in this parliament is very supportive of this legislation going forward. But is there a risk, if someone just genuinely believes what others uh, would rightly um, equate to coercive behaviour being domestic abuse, but if they are currently living through that just now and they don't themselves believe that to be domestic abuse now, their mindset will not necessarily change just because we pass a bill to that effect here in the Scottish Parliament. So how do we address that concern that an individual living through this, unacceptable though it is to those of us uh, in this Parliament and across Scotland, 
if an individual just doesn't believe that coercive behaviour is domestic abuse, will this legislation change it for those people? I think it changes it in a number of ways. I think you're absolutely right that some, some victims don't recognise it. It's a really common um, syndrome with domestic abuse that people can minimise behaviour, they can blame themselves, they might not even recognise they're a victim of abuse. I think one of the key things and, and one of the um, things about this is that it's a, a multi-agency response. There's a multi-agency response in, in relation to domestic abuse. So if the police um, receive a, a case, they can offer the victim a referral to a support and advocacy service uh, where there where one exists or to victim support for, for any victim of crime or to um, a women's aid centre, for instance. Um, when you have a new law um, like this, we are not just victims themselves and members of the public, but those who work directly with victims of domestic abuse then understand that that behaviour is criminalised. That also has an effect in terms of the people that they are working with and supporting and able to encourage them to go to the police where at the moment there might be no typically criminal behaviour that they would encourage them to report. So I think it can improve in that way. But I do think the point I made earlier around the stalking um, legislation um, is important because I remember when the stalking legislation came in and there were similar arguments, you know, this is very different. We're criminalising non-criminal behaviour. Um, you know, we're maybe interfering into um, personal life too much. Um, people are not going to come forward. And we have seen about a 12... Um, 12 times increase in the number of, of people prosecuted. So I think there is, a, there is a, a kind of issue where, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, once you have a law, it's not going to change overnight. Um, but once you have that in place, once people have confidence that there is something in place that says that conduct, that behaviour you're subjected to is against the law, then people will come forward. They'll be encouraged to come forward. And when they do, police officers who deal with them will understand what it is and can call it by its name and can investigate that and report it thoroughly for prosecution. If I could return very briefly to, to the issue of the uh, robust uh, prosecution of domestic abuse, which everyone um, is fully supportive of, and then some of the anxieties about um, over, uh, the over-rigid interpretation of the law. It was raised in the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry, which all members are focused on, especially today as we're debating that this afternoon. And um, at that time, the Lord Advocate did say he would look into that. Now, I'm conscious there's been a fourth protocol on uh, the joint protocol between um, police and the COPFS. I wonder if that's helped um, in make sure it's robust as opposed to over rigidly being um, interpreted. I have to say, I, I don't think it was over rigidly interpreted. I appreciate that there are perhaps comments um, and perceptions at times, but we operate to um, presumptions for prosecution. I think there are very good reasons for that. Historically, domestic abuse hasn't been dealt with well in the past, and it was overlooked as just a domestic. So I think there are really positive reasons for that and because of the harm that it causes to people that we do have robust presumptions in place for prosecution, but they are presumptions. And since I've been in place over the last almost four years, a big priority for me has been training. Uh, we introduced a, a considerable amount of new training for our staff, including a new accredited training programme for domestic abuse. And one of the big focuses on that has been around the dynamics of domestic abuse, around the circumstances where people might properly rebut the presumption to prosecute. It's about looking at the bigger picture and seeing the content. So that's been a, a focus for us. Um, in terms of the launch of the joint protocol, I think that's been a really positive... ...on that um, after the one minute silence, because I'm going to suspend uh, very briefly to allow everyone to stand in preparation for that now. Suspend.
Thank you. We'll now re resume our questioning. Yes, the uh, specifically on the, fo the, the fourth protocol. The joint protocol um, was launched at the end of March and it's the revised fourth edition which we spent um, a considerable amount of time over a number of months um, consulting not just between the Crown and the police and our own internal staff but also all the key victim stakeholders um, and all the organisations and we received incredible feedback from them which really helped to shape it. I have to say also the comments that came out through the inquiry um, into the Crown Office were ones that we um, took account of as well in terms of looking at our approach and, and making sure um, that it was effective. Um, we've enhanced it in a number of ways. Um, it makes absolutely clear around the requirement for sufficiency of evidence and it sets out very clearly um, what that means and that cases shouldn't be reported to the Procurator Fiscal without sufficient evidence. It also sets out clearly what officers are expected to report when reporting a case, both evidentially but also crucially in terms of the background information because we've recognised over a number of years that if you don't have the full picture you can't make Make appropriate decisions. So we're asking for information about the risk assessment that Leslie's spoken about, about previous history and dynamics of the relationship, any previous incidents involving the parties around their children, around vulnerabilities. So there's a lot of enhanced information there, which is also in a new SPR uh, reporting template, I should say, that, the, that we've introduced with the police. So I think there's been a lot of improvements there, um, which I think will really enhance the way we, we deal with these cases. Okay. Does that give you more comfort, um, Calum, Steve? Well, I, as with all things, Convener, when, when uh, policies are reviewed and uh, revised, they invariably result in improvements. Uh, and, you know, we're on the fourth protocol just now. I suspect it's not going to be the last, uh, because uh, every day is a school day in this job. And uh, uh, when, uh, uh, when we find things that we can do better, uh, whilst it doesn't necessarily happen immediately, uh, I'm fairly confident that eventually we get there and we try and put right the things that or certainly try and improve the things that uh, we can. Quite encouraging. I don't know if you want to say anything, Leslie. Actually, um, you know, it, it, in terms of the protocol, another step forward. And it is part of continuous improvement. And we may need another protocol in the future. But we are absolutely committed to making sure, in terms of domestic abuse, it has been a priority in Police Scotland and it continues to be a priority of Police Scotland. And in terms of our response to, to victims, and to making sure that there are reports that are submitted to Crown Office Procurator Fiscal are the best quality with the best background information so everybody can make the best decisions. Thank you. Oliver, then Liam and John. Thank you, Convener. A number of the points uh, I was planning to raise have already been covered, so sorry if I'm sort of going back over some of it. Um, but given how novel this legislation is and the concerns around the, the broad definition uh, do you think that the legislation achieves the right balance in establishing legal certainty? I think it does. I think um, the relevant effects have been quite um, well defined. There isn't a, a catch-all in a sense that you would have in the stalking offence. Um, there is the, the first part of the definition of abusive behaviour is about violent, threatening and intimidating behaviour, which would generally be criminal at the moment. But in terms of the relevant effects, I think they're based on um, consultation with key stakeholders and experts in domestic abuse and I think they really capture the essence of what victims talk about of their lived experience of abuse um, in terms of being made to be subordinate, being controlled, monitored, isolated uh, and also the um, deprivation of freedom and, and punishing and humiliating treatment. So in terms of the cases that we see and, and the circumstances that I've heard, uh, I think that that covers what we would be looking for um, in terms of trying to prosecute these offences. And do you think that there should be a level of seriousness attached to that? I think all these cases will probably by their nature have a level of seriousness. Um, I think what we're talking about in this offence is not just single incidents, um, it's a course of behaviour where there will be at least two incidences. Um, I think the reality is that there are likely to be many more than two instances, um, but we have to have at least two corroborated within, uh, within the, um, the charge. Um, but the reality is that people will probably be able to speak about uh, a number of different behaviours. Um, and I do think um, in terms of a threshold, um, I don't think it, it, you can put on an artificial threshold in terms of um, severity because it's very hard to, to, to judge that. This is not about impact and I think this is really important in terms of the offence. It's about the perpetrator's behaviour, whether or not that actually has 
a, an impact on the victim. See that, I, I, I think that's, that, that's in part what concerns me when we start to look at recklessness. If there's no, if there's no sort, of, uh, sort of qualification of the effect, uh, then it can be quite, quite difficult to look at that because I think that would change in different cases and in different circumstances. And I think there are obviously you know, a number of individuals who uh, are part of relationships where you know, behaviour perhaps isn't what most people would consider to be normal and is, can be quite unpleasant, but doesn't quite get to the level at which it would be criminal. And it can be a case, possibly, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of where you know, both parties are maybe involved in some of these behaviours, the relationship stops and starts, you know, at different points and there's different, you know, sort of different episodes throughout it. And what might appear reckless when a police officer takes a first look at it, you know, might might not, you know, within the context of that, you know, have have any have any effect on on either of the two individuals. I, th I think there. Um I don't think it should have a requirement for, for impact because I think then you go back to the situation where what about someone who actually doesn't recognise the impact or you could have people where they um, are impacted but there is no adverse um, outward sign of it. If you're talking about a physical assault where there's, um, there's a physical injury, um, that's very easy to, to demonstrate that but a lot of these will be internal uh, harms. Um, and you could have a situation where it's such a hidden crime that there will be people, including very high performing people perhaps, um, go about their day to day activities. People don't know that they are a victim of domestic abuse behind closed doors. Their children are out to school on time. Children are doing well at school. Everything seems fine. They may be high achievers in their own work life and nobody would know what was going on. So I don't think it should be about the visible impact eh, on someone. But I do think there are a number of safeguards in the bill. I think first and foremost, it has to be abusive behaviour as defined. And I don't think, as I said earlier, that normal friction is covered by this unless we class normal fiction uh, as behaviour which is designed to humiliate, frighten, degrade and punish. And I don't think that covers normal friction. I think there are a number of other safeguards as well. We have, it has to be a corroborated course of conduct. There also has to be um, the objective test where um, it's considered likely um, to cause harm. And there then has to be the intentional recklessness. So there, there are any number of steps there and safeguards that I would say that are in place in the, in the, in the offence. OK, thank you for that. Um, Mark, sorry. Point, the, about the threshold, um, psychological harm, um, one of the witnesses last, night, uh, last week said fear and alarm, fine, but distress he thought was too low a bar and he suggested it be serious distress. And following on from what uh, Oliver Mandel was saying then, you know, you may have an argument with someone, they may call you names, um, the person may respond, calling the other person names, you could describe them as being distressed, but it might just be a normal kind of argument, but serious distress is a much higher bar and perhaps um, a more reliable test. Well, I don't even think those kind of cases would get over the first threshold, which is they wouldn't be defined as abusive behaviour, and so they wouldn't even get to that stage. Um, I think, again, you're not talking about one-off instances. There has to be a course of behaviour, and I think the objective test um, of likelihood of causing harm. The courts are used to looking at objective tests. There's an objective test in breach of the peace. There's also an objective test in the section 38 where they look at a reasonable person test about likelihood of harm. So these are not new concepts that the prosecutors or the courts are, are, are unfamiliar with. Um, and I don't, think, um, I don't think having some kind of um, qualification of it has to be severe distress would, would, would add to that. I think it could detract and could reduce um, behaviours that we would, would want to cover within this. And I do think distress gives courts the flexibility to see is there a likelihood of harm in all its context here? And also is there intention or reckless to cause harm? I think there's sufficient safeguards there. We also have a defence of reasonableness in place as well. And sitting behind all that, obviously you have prosecutors applying a public interest test. Um, so all of that would safeguard in my view from uh, criminalising normal friction the view of the, the other panellists? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, legislation never always gets it right. Uh, if it did, then we wouldn't have courts of appeal and high courts. So it, 
it's, I mean, there is no doubt that the intention behind, to, to repeat what I said at the start, the intention behind the legislation or the bill as, uh, as published is one which I think most people, most sane, sensible people uh, would find to be uh, uh, fully welcome and uh, wholly supportive of. Um, and, you know, l listening to the evidence from Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, uh, these bars are not easily, pa they're not easily uh, overcome. Uh, you know, it's not just as if they're written on there for the sake of ticking a box, I would hope. Oliver, sorry. Uh, that that uh, comment there leads sort of nicely into to what I was going to ask next. I mean, given the sort of casting the net wide and leaving as much discretion for both officers investigating and courts further down the line, do you think that there's a risk that there will be a lot of people who come forward with aspects of, or, you know, or, or who've, who've experienced these types of behaviour but maybe don't have the evidence and that that has the potential to actually undermine the effectiveness of the legislation? You know, if we're not meeting some of the tests, you know, do you, do you think that it will sort of, almost, it's almost like, you know, we'll be uh, making it very, very clear that this type of behaviour is illegal but it doesn't actually overcome any of the problems around evidencing it and that people might feel sort of disheartened or feel it's not worthwhile pursuing their case? I don't think it's any different to where we are at the moment. You know, if people come forward, we, we have to operate according to the laws of the country and we have to have sufficient evidence. So there will be cases at the moment where the police are unable to report or the fiscal is unable to take proceedings in because there's insufficient evidence. And that can be very difficult, um, particularly where um, you're absolutely convinced in the credibility of the allegation. And that's something that we already have to deal with and have to, to manage people's expectations and also explain carefully why you know, we've been unable to, to take action. And um, I think um, people will at times be disappointed, but I would hope that when by coming forward, the police have links in place with support agencies to signpost them, to refer them on. And I would hope that I sometimes talk about prosecution and police intervention, um, police enforcement as an opportunity for an intervention. It's not always just about the case in court. It's actually the opportunities for the kind of wraparound care that goes around that, the referral to appropriate support. Um, so even if a case was unable to proceed, I would hope that people would feel more supported because they would be referred to uh, appropriate agencies and there would be more partnership working around that. Sorry, can I just come in? I absolutely agree with what I'm really saying. You know, there, there are challenges and uh, certain other crimes and offences um, are, are difficult and challenging to investigate, rape, etc. for one, um, probably because of corroboration. We don't say that because certain crime types are difficult that we would decriminalise them. We undertake robust investigations. Um, we ensure that the victims are signposted, as, as Amri said, to um, support services, whether it's a statutory agency through health and social care or um, third sector organisations for advocacy and support. And if the investigation doesn't um, provide a sufficiency of evidence, I think that is only right that we sit down with victims and we explain why, um, why there wasn't a sufficiency of evidence. And whilst it might be disappointing, um, I think it's far better that we do that than we have a system where we can't um, report, investigate and prosecute individuals for what is described as quite horrific uh, acts against their partner or ex-partner. So yet yeah, there might be challenges in certain occasions, but in actual fact that shouldn't be the reason why you know, this bill shouldn't be supported. Okay, um, and just finally on that, do you think uh, from your experience uh, that there is sufficient resources in place to, to take on that additional workload? We've seen through our uh, report um, you know, things like where, where previous changes have been made, you know, there's a, a significant number of additional people came forward to, to use certain services. Do you think that there's capacity for that at present? Um, as I've said, Police Scotland has domestic abuse as a priority and will continue to have a domestic, uh, domestic abuse as a priority. And I think from our consultation in 2026, it highlighted that uh, issues about um, a response to adversity, situational vulnerability is, is something that Police Scotland's looking closely at as to where resources are wired in the future. So 
um, that will be part of the discussions and and an actual fact what, what happens when the bills uh, if the bill is enacted as to um, how we via resources and how we make sure that there is sufficient resources to to uh, meet the needs of victims coming forward for this specific crime I would hope in time that with a, a long-term prevention strategy and with the various bits of legislation uh, back last year hopefully this new piece of legislation that there might be some form of deterrent in terms of uh, individuals enacting in such a way. You think it would be fair to expect a significant sort of increase in people coming forward and that there would need to be some dedicated additional resource put into the area? Um, I would hope more people will come forward. We would welcome more people to come forward. We would encourage more people to come forward. Yeah, to, answer to answer the question specifically in terms of resource, there is no doubt that uh, within policing that the area of domestic abuse is probably the one which gets the greatest form of internal attention. It's also the one which uh, uh, understandably has the, one of the greatest draws on officer time uh, because of the type of inquiries that they're dealing with and the type of uh, processes and assessments that are uh, accompanied with uh, reports of domestic, uh, domestic abuse. And as such, they are resource intensive. That's not a criticism, it's just a reality. Uh, if um, uh, we are uh, getting to a situation where we are putting in place processes to encourage more victims to come forward, the pressure on those resources is going to only become greater. Now, one of the important issues of under and when it comes to policing is understanding the holistic nature of what policing is about. It is not just about uh, attending to single incidents uh, uh, as and when they come in. There are many more complexities that come up from time to time. Uh, this week alone, we have elections. We have uh, a football match, a particularly difficult football match. Um, we, uh, we have a heightened awareness because of the current terrorist uh, threat. We have expectations from our communities that we provide reassurance patrols. Uh, we have other crimes and offences. Uh, so every time something is added to the statute book, uh, of course it creates additional pressures on the service in terms of resource and demand. Uh, and ultimately, and I uh, say this time and again, it, it, it is this place uh, with uh, its uh, hand on the checkbook uh, when it comes to uh, the allocation of financing to the police service that determines how much of a priority it wishes to make it because simply handing that responsibility back to the service and saying you decide and you allocate accordingly is somewhat uh, washing uh, of hands. Perspective. We're absolutely committed to this legislation. Um, it was the former Solicitor General, Leslie Thompson, who first called for this at our conference three years ago. Um, and so we're absolutely committed to it um, for the benefit that, that it introduces. Um, but we do acknowledge that it will be challenging and we do expect that there will be increased um, business and also can increase complexity in cases. Um, it's, I, I'm unable to be definitive at the moment because our budget's not known after this current year. Um, but the Lord Advocate has made it very clear that we will keep this under review and, and if there is a need um, to um, go back to the Scottish Government to ask for further money in terms of dealing with this, then, then, then we, would, um, we would do that as with other operational matters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Liam, followed by John, George and then Mary, and then we'll be looking to be winding up. Thank you, Convener. Can I start by reassuring Callum Steele that the Paris Cup tie between Bursley and Sandy this Saturday should not be too difficult to, to police. Uh, but I could I cover some of the ground that Oliver uh, Mundell's just touched on in relation to this issue of definitions and, and thresholds. I think a number of colleagues have alluded to the, to the uh, testimony took last week uh, from uh, Andrew Tickell, but let me, um, let, let me quote him directly. I think he, he himself expressed uh, some distress at us getting his name repeatedly wrong. Uh, but he went on to say, to prosecute an individual for abusive behaviour under the proposed legislation, the prosecutor need only show that the accused is engaged in monitoring or controlling behaviour on more than one occasion which was likely to cause distress, whether or not any distress actually arose. While monitoring behaviour may give rise to substantial harm, even relatively minor episodes in a relationship clearly have the potential to give rise to distress. To categorise this behaviour as criminally abusive risk being dramatically excessive. Do you think Andrew Tickell is, is wrong to have those concerns and what reassurance could you offer him um, based on what he said to the committee last week? 
I think obviously if he's looking at the, the legislation, he's taking a, a particular view. I suppose my view is formed not just by looking at that, but also my understanding of how we actually prosecute these cases. Um, as I say, I don't think um, very minor instances would even, uh, in what we might class as normal friction, would even meet the definition at the very first hurdle of what abusive behaviour is. But even beyond that, I think you would have to then see a course of conduct. You'd have to have that corroborated. You would then have to have um, the, the objective test of likelihood of harm and then on top of that the mens rea and even after all that you have the prosecutor applying the public interest there is no public interest in prosecuting non-abusive behaviour you've talked about the not just actual um, harm or the risk of harm which I think as you, you pointed to is, is very similar to the, the issue around child protection uh, but even instances where it, we're not talking about harm we're talking about um, distress and I think that's the thing that certainly for myself, maybe other committee members, um, seems potentially, I mean, I think you've described situations where I don't think anybody would have any difficulty with those being prosecuted with um, the full force, but areas where um, distress hasn't necessarily been acknowledged um, or, or yet caused seems uh, intuitively to, to, to set a bar um, too low given the, given the priority that's attached to, 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 to cracking down on domestic abuse and the fact that we're um, seeing this latest legislation being f um, brought forward to plug a gap. I don't think it does set it too low. I think we've seen um, examples in case law, for instance, around domestic abuse where they talk about distress. It's not something that's mere annoyance or, or upset. It would tend to be something more than that. Um, I think the danger, um, if you have a focus which is all about impact, so for instance, if you had to have um, the victim showing a particular impact, is that you, you almost go back to where we were a number of years ago, where it's not a domestic unless there's a, a battered you know, women, there's a, there's a visible sign. I think we've moved away from that. I think we're in a more nuanced territory here. Um, I think we have to say that there is behaviour which we are saying would be wrong, which we recognise as a likelihood of harm, which includes um, distress. It could also include anxiety. It could include other aspects. But that the legislation is just saying that psychological harm can include these things. So it's not saying that it would be a very low level. It would be a court would have to determine is there a likelihood of, of, of harm in, in a broad sense. Again, to the, the point I think you were responding to, to Ben McPherson and Douglas Ross earlier about the, the anticipated effect that introducing this legislation may have in encouraging others to have the confidence to come forward, that where um, they may, there may be a very common understanding of what harm or serious harm is, um, the understanding of what distress and anxiety um, is may not be a low bar in, in a legal sense in the way that, that um, prosecutors may take that forward, but, but in common parlance could be quite a low bar and people's expectations of, of what they may be, may be able to take, bring forward by way of uh, a complaint um, is, is not necessarily going to have the effect that, the, that they, would, uh, they would expect. Um, I, I don't think so, genuinely, because I think if you're talking about harm, psychological harm, I think people would be looking at that as something more than mere upset um, over a situation. And I go back to the, the fact that you would have to meet the test of what is abusive behaviour and it would have to be over a course of conduct. So uh, we aren't just talking about trivial instances. We're not talking about one-off instances here. We're talking about abusive behaviour. Um, the courts are used to... Um, applying an objective test of likelihood of harm and the section 38 threatening and abusive behaviour test also breach of the peace but 38 is probably the most commonly used domestic abuse offence now courts are applying that day and daily have no difficulty with applying an objective test around likelihood of harm and I think we'll continue to be able to do that and we will I think as one of the comments I said before we will continue to learn through the interpretation of case law and in, in terms of how the court interpret that but I think the danger is if you make it too restrictive and if you say that there has to be some kind of severity of harm well what does that actually mean do people have an understanding of what severe distress is as opposed to distress it feels quite subjective I think these matters are properly determined by the court having regard to the full facts and circumstances mm. Just turning to the issue of the reasonable defence, I think you, you alluded to it earlier. Um, I, there's been some suggestion that if um, 
if one needs to demonstrate intent or, or, or recklessness, in a sense, um, why is there any need for a reasonable defence and that um, that, in a sense, would, would countermand intent or, 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 or recklessness in terms of behaviour? Uh, can you explain why it is that we've got those, those sort of two, I don't know whether they're balancing or, or, or mutually supportive, but in a sense, you, uh, again, intuitively, you would have thought if you need to demonstrate intent and recklessness, then there isn't a necessity for, for that reasonableness defence. I think in, in a lot of our legislation, we have that um, a defence. We have it in the, the stalking offence, so there might be behaviours that might be technically captured, but there's an opportunity for people to um, to uh, say why it was reasonable. I think the explanatory notes to the bill give some examples, perhaps around gambling situations or you know other situations where action is taken which might appear to harm and there might be quite deliberateness about that but there's for good reason so i think the recklessness test for example yes, I mean, intent it would I, definitely be intentional but, yes. but it could, could demonstrably not be seen as reckless I, I think it would and i think most things would be captured by that i don't have an issue with a defensive reasonableness because i I think there should be a, an opening there for, because you don't know what a scenario might be that the defence might want to raise an angle. So I think in a fairness perspective, I think it's, it's useful when there's a defence available that people can raise. Um, but I think that will not be engaged, you know, necessarily in, in, in every case. OK, thank you. Uh, John, followed by George and then Mary. Thanks. I, I had a, a comment um, that, that I wanted to make earlier, and I wonder if the panel had anything to say. And it was, I entirely agree with uh, Mr. Steele on the, the, the basis of rehabilitation, and, and that, that's the d direction we should be going. I just wanted, it would certainly be my understanding that the, the view of practitioners in the field would be that rehabilitation is inappropriate and coercive and abusive behaviour, just as mediation is, because it could provide another opportunity for that behaviour. Is, is that your understanding? I think there's been, um, I think there are all different types of domestic abusers and there's lots of kind of research about people who perhaps could be more open to change their behaviour and, and others who might not. Um, I know there's been a lot of work done on the, for instance, the Caledonian programme. Um, it's not within my expertise in terms of the, you know, rehabilitation, but I think I, I take your point in terms of um, mediation, diversion, I think these will only be appropriate in, in, a, in a very limited circumstances and it's not something that we would say would generally be appropriate in domestic abuse, albeit that there might be some circumstances um, for that. But yes, I take your point on that. Okay, can I just ask on a term that appears in, in one of the documents and that's the term probably um, in one respect very helpfully describes the, the behaviour, but because of other connotations, perhaps unhelpful now, and that is the term intimate terrorism. I'm wondering if people will readily understand what coercive behaviour is. Um, I mean, they'll know the conduct if it's explained to them. Is there any difficulty you see around the, the terminology that's used in connection with this legislation? Well, I don't think intimate terrorism appears on the, the face of the bill. Um, yeah. That stems from Professor Michael Johnson uh -huh. uh, from America, who actually was over here. And just yes, yes he was over here a couple of years ago and actually um, spoke at the Scottish Prosecution College to a mixed audience we hosted of police and, and prosecutors. And he sets it out really well in terms of the different types of, of domestic abuse from the situational couple uh, incident, which he would call, which as I spoke about earlier, the bad relationship or bad time in a relationship where there's situationally provoked factors and then the coercive control or intimate terrorism. And I think the reason he came up with that was that very many victims described their experience as being terrorised often in their own home where they were subjected to stalking, monitoring, controlling behaviours that were akin to, to, to being terrorised. And that's how he came up with that uh, in terms of his own research. Do, do you think there's any difficulties about explaining the purpose of the bill to those we would want to benefit from it? I, I have to say I don't, and that's really from speaking to Women's Aid and the women that they deal with day and daily who talk to them about abuse and coercive control all the time. Um, I think um, when you, people now have a, a much greater understanding of coercive control, and I'm sure in terms of the progress of this bill, if it were passed, there would probably be some publicity around it, again, as we've seen with other um, legislation in order to, to enhance public awareness. But I think this is really reflecting people's lived experiences. I know you, you've heard from some victims directly, and I'm sure they've all spoken about that. So I actually don't think 
people will misunderstand it. And I think the fact that it describes itself as an offence of engaging in a course of abusive behaviour, I think people um, will, will be able to understand it. Does it, in fact, highlight the importance of Scottish Women's Aids and other support agencies? Absolutely, absolutely. They've been campaigning for um, this behaviour to be recognised criminally for a, a number of years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the terminology that they use in terms of that coercion of controlling, um, and I know that Callum was, was highlighting issues of training, um, we've introduced the whole aspect of coercive control into training at the Scottish Police College. So now the initial, pro initial probationaries training covers that in their domestic abuse training and also the se senior le leadership training uh, and supervisors supervisory training for newly promoted sergeants, that includes it. Um, we do have electronic um, training facilities through a Moodle, um, which I think Callum referred to in his uh, response. And there's two other, um, two other mandatory training courses that are done through Moodle, and that is the domestic abuse questionnaire and risk assessment, which I mentioned earlier on, and then another one on vulnerability. And in terms of preparing for, um, hopefully, the enactment of this bill, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work about what type of training we will need to train officers specifically in relation to this act. Um, so we have been down south. Uh, we've been liaising with um, Safe Lives, which is a national ch uh, charity to ending domestic abuse, and also the College of Policing look at their training material for when they rolled out uh, the um, Section 76 of the Serious Crime Act, um, which, albeit is a bit more extended than within partners and ex-partners. Uh, and looking at the training material that has been developed through support groups, through the College of Policing, um, to cover uh, all officers in terms of coercive controlling behaviour in domestic settings. So that looks really, really positive. Um, it's a bit about how we, um, how we deliver that, whether we do it from a police perspective, from our own training, or whether we ask for some sort of um, assistance from um, support agencies to assist with that training. But at the moment in time, we see it as a whole day course. Um, so in terms of terminology and understanding, whilst a whole day course is good, we will absolutely make sure that further information, guidance, is, is continued to ensure that officers absolutely do understand what coercive control is and what this bill would um, mean to them as frontline officers. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Uh, George, followed by Mary. Thank you, Convener, good morning. Uh, excuse me if I'm going over old ground and if, if I'm just trying to labour a point here, but I'm trying to get this out in, right in my own head at this stage. Is uh, There's been a number of things that I've been concerned with the use of an unfortunate use of language, or it might be just me misunderstanding the language that's been used, because last week we heard about low level of abuse, and to me abuse is abuse, and I can't see it any other way, so that's maybe more an issue with myself. But when Callum Steele says ordinary domestic friction, to me that whole idea is, did you bring that pint of milk I asked you for? No, I didn't. Q 20 minute discussion about whether how you couldn't get that pint of milk, you know, and uh, how you take that leap to actual controlling behaviour and abuse, it's quite a leap. And is the whole point of this bill not just to get it right in my own head, is it not to actually make sure that we actually get the seriousness of this and the, the abuse that's going on in some of these households and we get to a stage where we can actually, A, those that need to be protected are protected and B, those that are actually uh, causing the abuse are actually found out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't think this is about trivial or minor offending. Mm -hmm. This is this is about patterns of abusive behaviour um, and, and I think the Act sets out um, sufficient tastes and thresholds and safeguards in it that we can be confident about it, but absolutely agree with you. Thanks. Okay. So I have got it right then. <laughs> <laughs> did you want to say something, John? I did convene, and whilst, whilst I understand that there is a world of difference between ordinary domestic friction and abuse, uh, you know, with every possible respect to uh, Mr Adam, you know, the pint of milk thing is, I actually think is probably trivialising it somewhat. You know, sometimes relationships can break down. Sometimes people can have a difficult time when the relationships are breaking down. Sometimes they can be pretty, pr uh, particularly horrible to each other. Uh, 
doesn't necessarily mean that in six months' time that with the benefit of hindsight they would consider that any of that behaviour might have been criminal. Uh, but the potential could be that police officers get involved at a particular difficult time of normal domestic friction because of breakdown of relationships. Uh, it happens. Uh, police officers are, uh, pl the police services are called and uh, we, we find ourselves in these kind of uh, situations where we can be pawns in uh, domestic uh, breakdown rather than necessarily uh, whether it's abuse. And the allegations that can come from that can, on the face of it, appear to be uh, criminal, uh, but whether, like I say, with the passage of time people would take that view uh, would be something that uh, I suspect they probably wouldn't in a large number of occasions. I already answered John Finnell earlier on when he asked about the fact that uh, when your officers do turn up on uh, the site, they do have the ability and they are able to tell the difference between ordinary domestic friction. If there has been a long ongoing scenario, nine times out of ten, you're pretty aware of the situation. That, that's not always the case uh, in, in, in absolute truth because the first time they get called is often the first time that they're aware. Um, the, I mean, I, I, I am not in any way trying to undermine the seriousness of the issues that this bill is trying to address. For us, with all legislation, I think it's important that we give consideration to not just those that it is intended to capture intentionally, but those that might be caught unintentionally. Uh, and uh, it's on that latter element of it that I believe it is important that a great deal of consideration is given uh, and much attention is given to the training that is going to be delivered to police officers and, crucially, the support that is going to be given to them uh, if they end up being criticised for undertaking activities uh, in good faith that then turn out to be uh, subject to uh, significant adverse comment at a later date. Mary? Thank you, um, convener. Um, I wonder if I could just ask, and I think um, Anne-Marie would probably be the best person to answer this question about non-harassment orders, because the bill would require the court to consider a non-harassment order without um, a, a need for application from um, the prosecution. And the information that, that we have, I, I understand that currently the granting of non-harassment orders is, is fairly low. In 2015-16, criminal cases registered with a domestic aggravator in Scotland, there were 17,804. And criminal cases issued um, with a, a non-harassment order there was only 767. Is there a particular reason that non-harassment orders, um, the, 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 the issuing of them is so low? I think practice varies, I have to say, through courts. Um, where we find um, in the specialist domestic abuse courts, um, where um, sheriffs are dealing with these cases day in, day out, we find anecdotally that we are more likely to um, get non-harassment orders. But practice does vary throughout the country. Um, it's something that we are very keen on and very keen to promote in our guidance, and certainly we've reflected that in the new joint protocol, is that in all cases of domestic abuse and stalking, prosecutors will consider the appropriateness. Now, not every case of domestic abuse will require um, a non-harassment order. Um, also, it's important that we take the victim's views on that. I think we have to recognise that in some cases of domestic abuse, people want to reconcile. Um, so they may not want a non-harassment order, or it may relate to abuse that's happened in the past, and so they may feel that one's not necessary. Um, so we will always take the victim's views on that, and there, there will be occasions when people don't want one and don't require one. So um, I think it's a really positive thing to have this in um, so that it's considered in every case. It won't be granted in every case. It may, won't necessarily be appropriate in every case, but I think at least if it's given specific consideration by the, by the, the court, uh, I think that's a really positive step forward, and I think you're likely to then see an increase in non-harassment orders. Is there a resourcing issue attached to um, non-harassment orders? Um, no, not in terms of the, the granting of them, um, no. Not, not that I'm aware of. Obviously, um, breach of a non-harassment order is a, is a criminal offence in itself. And so um, if there's someone, if there's an allegation of breach of an order, then the police are engaged. So there's resource implications, but not in terms of the, of the granting of orders, no. And actually, very often, the feedback we get from victims is that that's the part of the sentence that they are most interested in. Do you know, if they're looking for a non-harassment order because they want that protection, going way forward after the court case has ended. OK, thank you. Was there not an implication there might be a resource issue if it was automatic to consider a 
a, a non-harassment order. And I don't know if that's relating to perhaps a background report that might have to be then produced in every case. Um, I think in all these cases, um, the, the report that it wouldn't be a, a, an extra background report, it would be the court asking the, the fiscal for input as to the, the victim's perspective, but that's already there in terms of our guidance that we should be obtaining that. And in terms of the new reporting template that we introduced for domestic abuse with the police, the police should be providing us with that when they're reporting the case. So I don't see any change in terms of um, what we would be doing at the moment. There's only one aspect I think we haven't covered, and that's the expert um, the expert evidence. Um, Schedule one five expert evidence relating to the behaviour of the complainer um, has been raised in the submission from the SPF. I wonder if you could perhaps speak to that. There's interesting issues raised there, Callum Steele. Thank you, convener. I think to some extent the evidence from the Crown Office of Procurator and Fiscal Service this morning has. Uh, on some way to uh, responding to that, because if I, if I understood uh, correctly, it, it wasn't so much uh, uh, evidence of expert evidence in terms of what had occurred on that particular set of occasions, but what the behaviour in its own right might amount to. Uh, the, I think there are, however, some, and these, and these are ultimately judicial uh, considerations rather than ones for the police, but uh, there are issues uh, or potential issues in respect of how expert evidence can be, or how expert opinion can be formulated uh, when you're only ever going to get, gather it from one side of, uh, of, of the account, unless, of course, there's a presumption that the accused is not going to have a right to silence, which uh, that, there's clearly that, that's clearly not the case. So certainly whilst uh, at the time when we were putting uh, our submission together, it was our understanding that this was going to be based on uh, expert evidence of the course of behaviour that was before the courts. Uh, if I understood COPFS correctly this morning, that was going to be evidence on what the type of behaviours in their own right amount to, rather than necessarily being bespoke to the specific situation. Is that right? I, I think there's a, a two issues here that I, I should clarify. In terms of the evidence that we would expect to lead in this case, we will lead evidence as we would now from um, a range of witnesses and perhaps other evidence, which might be um, social media, telephony evidence, there might be CCTV evidence in a case, um, neighbours, friends, family, uh, the complainer themselves. So th the evidential base, in a sense, doesn't change. We will just have to look for um, sources of evidence. In terms of the expert evidence provisions in the schedule, these relate to Section 275C of the Act, and it's specifically to bring domestic abuse in line with sexual offending. And it's, it's purely for the purpose of leading expert evidence to explain behaviour or statements in order to rebut um, negative adverse um, inferences about the credibility and reliability of a witness. So, for instance, um, this is commonly used at the moment in sexual cases to explain why people delay in disclosing or reporting. Um, and, and so what we've discovered, and one of the reasons actually even separate to this legislation that we had um, contacted the Scottish Government to ask that this be widened to domestic abuse comes directly from our advocate deputies prosecuting in the High Court because what they tell us is that they will frequently use this evidence in sexual offence cases to explain why someone remains in a relationship um, and continues even though there has been dreadful sexual abuse um, and that evidence is um, generic evidence that can explain and, and almost neutralise the fact that somebody might draw a negative inference of that, just to explain that there's a lot of research around this that people don't always report, um, for instance, instances of abuse when they occur. Um, but we, didn't we don't have that currently for domestic abuse. So this provision is purely around that to allow us then to lead that similar type of evidence to explain why people remain in an abusive relationship, why they didn't report the abuse to the police. It's not about wider context of, of, of um, leading evidence more generally. The reasonable person test in the, the objective test at the start of the, the offence is, is something that the court will interpret um, and with or without e expert evidence, but the expert evidence provisions are, are purely around um, rebutting any negative inference. Okay, I think that's helpful. Does it allay your, your fears? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly, uh, it certainly helps explain them, uh, the, 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 the issue that, um, you know, the, the fact that the fact that there's uh, that it's talking about behaviours and activities rather than necessarily the, the specifics before the court as a general provision, I, I don't think is, uh, is problematic. 
Thank you. I think that concludes our um, questioning. Can I thank all the witnesses for what's been a very uh, helpful evidence session? And um, we now suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave. Consideration of three negative instruments. I refer members to paper four. The first instrument is the first tier tribunal for Scotland oaths regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 148. Do members have any comments? John Finney. I do. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I, I, I read this, this proposal with interest. It's not my intention to oppose it. But I have to say, I did have to take a double take on the date that it was 2017 because requiring an oath of allegiance, and I took the opportunity to look up the Promissory no Oaths Act 1868 um, and actually check the, the form of the oath of allegiance, which in this version, and certainly the version that we're led to on the internet, is to swear to be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her uh, Majesty Queen Victoria, albeit it does talk about her heirs and successors. I think um, it's disappointing that in a modern liberal democracy we still have this, but um, I hope that those who are asked, indeed required, to make it will take the opportunity, as a number of elected parliamentarians do, to express that their primary obligation is to members of the public. Point noted. Are there any other comments? No. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. The next instrument is Act of Sederant Fees of Sheriff Officers Amendment 2017, SSI 2017, oblique 153. Do members have any comments? If there are no comments, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. The final instrument is Inquiries into Fatal Accidents and Sudden Deaths, etc. Scotland Act 2016 Consequential Provisions, Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 oblique 156. Do members have any comments? In that case, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. That concludes consideration of negative instruments. Our next and final agenda item is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 1st June 2017. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments and questions. And I refer members to paper five, which is a note by the clerks. And invite Mary Fee to provide that feedback. Thank you, um, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 1st of June when it took evidence on the Auditor General's reports on the review of Police Scotland's I-6 programme and the 2015-16 audit of the Scottish Police Authority. The subcommittee heard that the failure of the I-6 project had impacted on the ability of police officers and staff to do their jobs effectively. Investment in Police Scotland Estate, Fleet and ICT is essential. We therefore welcome Police Scotland's confirmation that it will not transfer any underspend of its capital budget 
to its resource budget this year. And the subcommittee received assurances that lessons have been learned and we look forward to seeing how future ICT projects will be developed and to consider the three-year and ten-year financial plans which are to be published in June and September, respectively. The subcommittee will next meet on the 15th of June when it will hold an evidence session on the use of police body-worn cameras. And I'm happy to take any questions. John Finney. Simply a comment. I, I, it's, it's an accurate reflection of our meeting. However, I think we did hear from Mr Levin that there are mechanisms which facilitate communication between different groups of officers, which wasn't the case before even the ending of... Uh, so it, it, it is not um, impacting on Julian efficiency in that regard. Any other comments? Uh, Liam? Yes, thank, I, I think John's right, and I thank Mary for the, the summary of, I think, what was a very useful um, session. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the failure of the IC, uh, I6 uh, programme uh, has prevented the delivery of the efficiencies that were uh, many of the, under, uh, the efficiencies that were underpinning the rationale um, for creating Police Scotland. Nevertheless, I think what was helpful from the evidence session last week uh, was some sort of reassurance about the, the, the structure and practices that are now in place. I think give a lot more confidence, perhaps, than we've had in the past that those challenges might be met. But they're not out of the woods yet. Okay, any other comments? Okay. I, I think just to um, add to the comments that um, John Finney and, and Liam MacArthur have made, I was certainly quite heartened by some of um, Mr Levin's um, comments and the evidence that we heard from him. And it, it does, I have a slightly more confidence um, than I had before the evidence session of how things will progress. Okay. Well, on that positive note, this, that concludes our 21st meeting of 2017. Our next meeting will be Tuesday 13th of June, which will uh, continue our evidence taking on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. And could I ask the gallery to, to leave? <laughs>